this is the first time that I present this paper in this incarnation. And it's a paper about teacher hiring, but I think also it's a lot about a paper about hiring workers in an environment where it's difficult to observe worker productivity and where institutions are weak. I think it's, it's also very informative about this, uh, this kind of environment. So first, on, on the teacher side, on the teacher quality side, let's say, there is a quite a big literature that tells us teachers matters. So having a teacher that is high quality will help a lot of kids. And I think that's kind of a lot of consensus in the literature. And there is also another consensus that is, uh, let's say, less optimistic. That is, even if we know that teachers matter and that we want to find good teachers, actually identifying who is a good teacher, or even worse, who can be a good teacher, is actually pretty difficult. And it's difficult because easily observable characteristics that an administrator can observe at the moment of hiring are very poor predictors of teacher quality. Credentials, experience beyond the three years, typically studies don't find that it's helped you a lot to identify teacher quality. The large part of the variance in teacher quality is within these characteristics. So that's put us uh, in a kind of a big challenge, right? We want to hire good teachers, but we don't know exactly who are good teachers. Now, the second part that I was telling you, telling you is, I mean, there are some studies that tell us that increases in, in school inputs not always translate into better student outcomes, right? Hanushek, I think, has made many compelling papers in the US. And uh, for developing countries, I think that there is also this, this nice literature review that Gliwi and, and Hanushek and other, another does, where when they look at the high quality, what they call high quality studies on the effect of inputs on student outcomes, that they don't find a very uh, strong evidence that necessarily increasing the student inputs all the time translate into better student outcomes. And uh, so the one, there are many reasons why this can happen, right? But one potential reason, especially in, in, in countries with weak institutions, is that the increasing resources allocated to schools or public service in general are not actually used for their intended use, right? But are being extracted by some uh, actor. And uh, that, of course, would make it difficult that they fulfill their original purpose, right? Now, the problem here is rent extraction is difficult to observe. People don't declare it in surveys, uh, so it's, uh, for, for, for analysts, it's difficult to, to go and see, right? Because it's, it's illegal in most, many cases, or at least it's something that uh, people who re extract rents, sometimes they don't want to publicize. So then it's difficult to observe, and if difficult to observe, it's going to be more even difficult to change, right? So, but I think that... There are some cases where we can approximate rate extraction, and that's something that I, that I try to do in this paper. In the paper, I, I write a very simple principal agent model to give intuition about uh, this a scenario of uh, you having imperfect information about worker productivity in a principal agent model. I'm not going to talk about the model, even if it's very simple, but I'm just going to give you the intuition, OK? So suppose administrators do not observe quality of good would be teachers, right? They don't know who are good teachers. Who, they cannot distinguish good from bad teachers. But maybe current teachers do. They do. And actually, there are some papers that tell us this, right? There are some papers, like one in the, in the US, by Jacob and a co-author, that tell us that, for example, uh, principals in schools are able to identify at least the good teachers, the very good teachers, from the very bad teachers. Measure this by value added. And there are also other papers uh, using New York City data that tell us that actually maybe using just one criteria to predict teacher quality is not very informative, but if you mix a lot of criteria, then you can come up with a better predictor of who's a good teacher. And maybe current teachers can do this. Or maybe, see, maybe they, don't, they, they know better how to judge motivation, how to judge who, who really is a good teacher for these kids. And they might, they might be do good at doing this work, okay? So we might think, okay, let's, let's trust in teachers to hire new teachers, and current teachers, right, to hire brand new teachers. So it might be a, good, a very good idea. Now, if the agent, so the current teacher, only cares about teacher quality, then you, you will get a very nice outcome, right? You give him an exogenous weight, and he will hire the best guy he can get for this wage. And everybody's happy. Now, 
But what happens if the agent does not derive only utility from teacher quality, but derives utility from a private rent, from consumption he can use from a private rent? Then it's kind of easy to show that he will basically prefer to hire a lower quality teacher, and then he would prefer to bargain with the hiring for the differential between the opportunity cost of this guy in the labor market and the wage posted, right? Just, okay, I will give you just maybe very basic intuition. Suppose this, suppose, remember, the principal cannot observe teacher quality, right? So if I only care about rents, let's say I don't care about teacher quality, what is my incentive? And I hire the worst guy, the guy who will get a very low wage in any job, right? And then I can bargain with him to share the differential, the gap, between the wage that he will get and the wage that he will get otherwise, right? That's what I write there. It's a simple model. Obviously, you can think a little bit more complicated, but that's, that's the main intuition, okay? I think it's a very basic, basic intuition. Now, of course, if the principal knows the agent type, he might be better off not using this very well-informed agent, but let's say not preference aligned, but using instead a hiring rule that maybe is a second best predictor of, of quality, but it's better than, hire, than having this non-incentive aligned agent. In the model, is, my, my rule is uh, just choose a random, but in real life, you don't have to choose a random, right? You can use a poor predictor, maybe an exam, for example. That's actually what I will see in the data, what I try to see. Okay, actually, again, you don't have to think that maybe it's not that only that agents, that the, what only matters is the preference of the taste for private trends. In a more dynamic setting, you may think that they are also incorporating the probability that they are punished if they hire a bad teacher, right? Suppose I have an agent and I tell you, please hire a teacher for me, and then two years later, later I notice that the teachers he's hiring are very, very bad, and I keep punishing him. So he, he will obviously, if he is forward-looking, he will take this into account. But if you are in an environment with very weak institutions, and that's very unlikely, he will have even incentives to keep hiring low-quality teachers, right? So even in a more dynamic incentive, you could get something like this. Just like the, what you would identify is not just a test for, let's say, uh, rent extraction, but it's more also a capacity to, to actually rent extract. Extract rents. So, okay, so these papers investigate the effect on the student outcomes of hiring teachers using a standardized test versus a discretionary process with a strong involvement from the teacher union. Okay? That's what I'm going to look. I try to identify a potential rent extraction. And for doing this, I use a recent reform to teacher hiring in elementary schools in Mexico. So just a quick uh, overview of how actually how public schools are run in Mexico. The state, Mexico is a federal state, so we have 32 states. And the state governments are in charge of operating public elementary schools. While the federal government provides the bulk of the money and set minimum standards, right? Teaching hours, curriculum, stuff like that. But it's a state at the central level who operates the schools. And that means, in practice, they centrally ha do, do hiring, promotion, and allocation of teachers to schools. This is very important. The schools do not hire teachers. It's the state who hire teachers and become a state-level employee. Okay? And then when they hire teachers, they, do, they hire a teacher to be a math teacher, to be a Spanish teacher, to be an elementary school teacher, but not to be a teacher in the primary school in Puno. That's the second stage where they allocate teachers to schools. That's going to be very important for my identification. I will spend some time discussing the allocation of teachers to schools. Okay? Now, here in this paper, I'm going to focus on one specific set of schools that in Mexico are called telesecundarias. These are junior high schools, I mean grades 7 to 9. Kids are typically 12 to 15. And there are small schools scattered to small communities. Mexico is a country where you have a lot of mountains and you have a lot of small localities kind of isolated, where there are not the economics of a scale necessary to have a regular high school. Regular high school, I mean one when you have mad, one math teacher, one Spanish teacher, one per subject. Okay? So to solve this problem, what the government did is create these very small schools where you have one teacher per class, typically, and you have a lot of IT technology. What does it mean is that the school day has six hours, 
two hours of the day, they receive programs produced in Mexico City by TV, especially for this school system. Okay? So this is a school system where teacher quality should be less relevant, right? If I have something in this uh, school system, it's going to be very informative. Okay, so just to give you an example, the median telesecondary school in my sample has 69 students divided in three classrooms located in a locality of around 800 people. So really small localities, really small schools, okay? Now, obviously, these are these, 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 the kids here tend to be more poor, rural, blah, blah, blah. Now, even if this is a system very particular, just something I want to say, doesn't mean that it's kind of rare, right? It's you, they, they, one, more than 1.2 million of, of students go to this type of a school in Mexico. And that's around 20% of total enrollment in the level. So it's an, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important system. So how does it work hiring? Let's say, how does it work the status quo? As I, before say, as I said before, each state centrally hires teachers and hires teachers to be a state employee, not hires teachers for school A, B, or C. Okay? Then to be a teacher in junior high school, you must have college level education. That's a requirement. You cannot hire a, a guy with only elementary school. Second, and this is very important, is in practice, the teachers' union plays a key role in hiring. One, in, in two ways. One is disseminating information about vacancies. And this is not a minor thing, because before the reform, vacancies were rarely publicized. So you, and you cannot apply to a job you don't know that exists. So actually, having a connection with the union is key, because otherwise, you don't know there will be jobs available in this type of teaching position this year in your state. So it's important information here. Second is directly proposing candidates, basically by two mechanisms. By law in Mexico, all the unions in the public sector are entitled to select the candidates of half of the share of the expanding stock of public employees in their sector. So for the, for the expanding stock of teachers in the states, the teacher union had the right to say, I suggest Guy, Marcos, and Andres to be hired. Second, and this is more informal, but it's, and there's huge anecdotal evidence that this is a very wide practice, very wide practice, is that retiring teachers typically propose a candidate to be replaced when, he, when they retire. Again, they don't have to be, they don't have to teach in the same school, but they will be hired as a, as, a, as a state teacher. Now, this is not only anecdotal evidence that exists, but actually when the reform came and the teacher union contested the reform, one of the main arguments is that retiring teachers would lose the right to sell their positions or, and, that would, and that would hurt their, uh, the investment they have made. Okay? So this is apparently a wide practice, right? I mean, enough for union teacher, for leaders of the teacher union to go to the media and say, this is bad for us for this reason. So obviously there is a lot of criticism to, to this kind of hiring, right? You cannot think that is the most efficient way of hiring teachers. So, so, the, so the state, the, the federal government came and said, okay, okay, we cannot do this. And because they give most, most of the funding, they could twist the arm of the states to apply some sort of different, different hiring. And the idea was, was let's introduce test-based recruitment. We will do a test, an exam, in every state. The, the exam is, in, is the same at the national level, but, the rank, but we will rank at, a, at each state the best candidates, and we will hire the best, uh, those who do best ranking, those who do best in the exam, okay? There is one exam for each type of teachers, so the teachers who want to be teach math do a different exam than the teachers who want to teach uh, science, okay? Now, obviously, there was large opposition from local uh, union leaders. So in practice, they say, okay, we're going to mix both systems. And, we, and then the way they mix it is kind of with that, this unwritten rule. That is, okay, for, for those who are retiring, we're going to hire through the traditional system. And that means 80% of the vacancies per year. In, 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 when we are increasing the, the stock of teachers because there are more kids, or there are more schools, and we create new payroll positions, we're going to fill these payroll positions through the test. And this is around 20% according to my estimates. Okay? So each year, every state hired teachers through both systems. Basically, for in, 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 any of both, in any of both systems, you have to have college education. 
Now, in the case of the test, on, on the test examination, there are more restrictions to, be, to have to be graduate from a teacher school in the state. This is also college education. Now, this, this in a way is a little bizarre because what most people would argue is that one of the ways of improving teachers, the quality of incoming teachers, is allowing to recruit also teachers in other, uh, or from other majors, especially because the reputation of teacher schools in Mexico is not the best. So, okay, now I will go. Obviously, I have at, this, I, at each state, I have variation in how teachers are hired. But if I want to make any comparison in the outcomes of the students that receive these teachers, I have to tell you something about how teachers are allocated to schools. Because obviously, this is not random. Okay? Now, the reform didn't change how this works. Now, how does it work? You have, this is official, you have joint committees of a state official, officials, and union members. And these guys are in charge of allocating teachers to vacancies. But just this, the way it works basically, just to give you an example, suppose there are, in the state, there are three localities, right? One is in the capital of the state, one is in the second city in the state, and the third is in a small village in the mountains, isolated, where you have to be uh, tough to get there, let's say. Now, typically, the guy who lives in the city is the oldest teacher and retires. So that vacancy opens up. And then this vacancy is open to applications from current teachers. That's by, by, by law and that's the way it's followed. Then what will happen is the teacher in the second uh, city, which is typically the guy with the highest tenure afterwards, will say, hey, I want to move to the capital city. And he will get it. And then the teacher in the a small village, isolated village, who said, hey, I want to move to the second largest city. And then he will get it. And then you have a vacancy in the isolated uh, poor village. Okay? And the new teacher, the, new, the, the brand new teacher, will be allocated there. That's the way it works. My story is that it's based, as, you, as, as, as this predicts, it's just basically allocation depends on teacher preferences that typically, anecdotically, the people tell, are based on geographical characteristics of localities and depends on the commission's uh, uh, evaluation of the applicant's merit, right? Now, for the case of the new teachers, those who are hired through the test, or those who are hired through the committees, whether this happens and which receives more weight in the, in, in the joint committee's evaluation, that's an empirical question. It's an empirical question that I'm gonna try to answer. You will tell me if I have a good answer or not. But before that, I have to show you the data. So I'm using three, three source, sources of data. One is a new source of data that was created by the mandate of the Mexican government, Mexican Federal Congress in 2010. And it's basically a payroll of all teachers in the country that are paid with federal money. And this is almost everybody, at least in elementary school, okay? This was created in the second quarter of 2010, and I have the information from the, from the other four quarters uh, of the year. So in this, in this uh, payroll, which is a census, I know which teachers were hired through the test in 2008, which is the first year of the test was held, 2009 and 2010, and in which school were assigned, and I can track them, okay? Now for the discretionary hired teachers, there is no official listing. But I can do something that is basically, because this is a census, I can go to the second quarter of 2010, which is the last quarter of that academic year, and I co can compare those teachers with the teachers present in the next academic year. And, I can, uh, and, uh, and then I assume that the new teacher, that the, that the teachers that I found in, two, in, in 2010 that were not in the previous academic year are new teachers, okay? So that's basically what I do. Now, okay, for, then for, for measuring student outcomes, I have a national standardized test that is in LASI. This is taken at grade nine. This is the end of junior high school. And it's done since 2006. So I have six years. And then the subjects are Spanish and math and they have a school census with some data, okay? So with this, I'm going to construct a panel of schools with new telesecondary teachers. Now, 24 states recruited teachers in 2010, but since, the, but it, when, First, this database was created, many states gave incomplete information, so I cannot use them because I cannot make the comparison. There's not a census in the two quarters of 2010. 
And then <laughs> I, I, I also don't don't put two two states in in my in my sample because in the in in, in the in the examination for brand new teachers, they allowed the participation of all teachers. They didn't say that, but when I go to the <laughs> to the data set, I see that the new recruits were already working there. Okay, so obviously I cannot use them in my estimation because these are not new teachers. So then I construct a panel with around 1,200 schools in 30 states, because I have to. Okay, I have to restrict to schools who have never received a 2009 and 2008 test teacher. Why? Because my treatment is 2010. There is when I can compare teachers who were hired through the test to schools with teachers who were hired through the normal examination. Because before, I don't have the counterfactual. I cannot construct a counterfactual for being hired to the committees. Now, fortunately, schools do not need a teacher every year. Right? So I can only focus on those schools who have not opened vacancies before 2010 and hence have not received a test teachers. So I focus on those. And then I just check that these, these schools have been in the, time, in, in the sample time enough to be sure that my, uh, my results are going to be not uh, driven by changes in the composition of the schools. That means I, I left out new schools. Okay? So given said that, around one-eighth of the schools in my sample received a test teacher in the school year 2010. I'm going to study saying this. What is the probability of receiving a, a test teacher? The de it's, it's a linear probability model. The dependent, these are schools who in 2010 received a brand new teacher. Okay? One, so the outcome is received a test teacher. And I want to see if the model of allocation of teachers to school is consistent with my story. That is driven by geographical factors. Or if not, and that could be a very large concern for my identification, is driven by past school performance. So what you basically have at the first uh, rows is, the, is the student outcomes for the last year and the previous last year, for two lag years. Okay? If state officials are saying, you know, these test teachers are better, we should allocate them to failing schools because we care about uh, equalizing school outcomes then we should expect that some of the coefficients in the first uh, rows are statistically significant. But we don't see that. I test the joining significance, I fail to reject the null. It doesn't seem that joint committees are allocating teachers to school based on past school performance. And that's very important for my identification because as you could imagine, I'm gonna do a diff and diff using the panel structure of the data. In, 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 in return, what you could observe is that the geographical characteristics of the localities predict treatment, predict the assignment of test teachers. Basically, these test teachers are more likely to allocate to localities with higher poverty rate, which are, la which are further away from the state capital, which uh, uh, and, um, is likely by, po lo by locality population, but it's, it's very small, and, uh, and which has, uh, having more electricity means less likely you will get a test teacher. So in a way, you see these joint committees that are allocating their discretionary higher teacher basically to better localities, right? Less poor, better public services, closer to the state capital. Now this is nice for my identification because when I do a diff and diff, this will go away, right? And I will be based my identification on past trends and there doesn't seem to be a problem with past trends, even though I would test further. So as I said before, I'm going to do a diff and diff with fixed effects. Okay? Something important to keep in mind is I, I'm estimating a defect at the school level. That's, in a, that's why I'm focusing in very small schools, because then the probability that my teacher actually teaches the, st the students that take the test is going to be higher. Right? Now, you would like to say, why you don't you estimate at the classroom level? Because teachers don't teach at the whole at, at, at the whole school. They only typically only teach one classroom. Well, there are two things. One, I cannot make the link between teachers and classroom. And second is, if I do that, identification would be much more complicated because then I would have to claim that allocation of teachers to classrooms is random. And there is much, much harder assumptions to make to, 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 to be able to do that. And I also have to say that there is no uh, externalities within schools which is also much harder to say because you could imagine that you, have, you get a very good teacher and it's allocated to one classroom and is doing a great job 
then the principal has more time to spend on the, on the, on the other classrooms. And that would buy us any, uh, any comparison made within a school at the classroom level. So this is also a, a good argument to make it at the school, to make this comparison at the school level. Okay? Even if the probability that you find an effect is, is lower. So I'm controlling for a vector of jerk dummies, a school time variant component. So I'm making within a school comparisons. And what is key also, I'm, I'm allowing, uh, I'm, in, in my time varying uh, variables, I'm putting also a state, bar state time varying fixed effects. I'm not, not fixed effects, state time varying effects. So I'm allowing that if some states are improving some for whatever reason, and the states that are improving for whatever reasons are, are using more the test because they are improving, that would buy up my, my estimates. To, av to avoid that, I am putting this, which is a strong restriction in the data, I'm, I'm putting a, a state uh, time varying effects. So the beta can be interpreted as a causal parameter under the parallel trend assumption, right? That the trend of the control schools, which control in this context mean the schools that receive the discretionary teacher, represents the trend that the schools that receive the test teachers would have had in absence of treatment. And I will give you, uh, I cannot probably direct, directly test this hypothesis, this assumption, but I will give you some uh, additional uh, evidence that this makes make sense. Now, something important is that beta captures a total policy effect, which comprises the relative capacity of each method to identify teacher quality and actually higher teacher quality. Second, the propensity of the pool of potential candidates to sort between each method. Suppose I am a teacher, wanna be, would be, what would I would, would like to do? Do the test or go for, to the hiring communities? Maybe they will think I will go to where my comparative advantage is, right? There will be some process of selection and this will capture here. And third, any response from schools and parents to the policy. Now, uh, this, this means that this is not a structural parameter in, edu in an educational production function, but that also means that if, if, if test teachers are much better, and then, as some literature shows, parents adapt to the better inputs in a school by reducing effort, this would be a, there will be a downward bias in, in, in beta as parameter of the quality of the teachers. Okay? And then beta is also informative as a lower bound of rent extraction for the reasons that I told you before. So here I'm using my definitive model, but I'm using only the five years before treatment. And I'm interacting treatment status, potential treatment status, with years before treatment. And I have a, a set of four outcomes. And the, the first column is final enrollment in the year compared to the initial enrollment in the year. You might think that one of the benefits of having a better teacher is he's able to keep students at, at class, avoiding attrition. The second column is the share of flag exams in this end of the year exam, examination. What does it, this mean? It means cheating. The Ministry of Education runs an algorithm that detects basically that unlikely compatibility of incorrect responses across the students. The students should have similar correct responses if they are smart and they are getting the responses right. But in a multiple test options, there are no reason for which students should be consistently putting the wrong answers, the same wrong answers. Okay? This test is used in, in the literature as a lower estimate for cheating in classroom. So it's also a lower estimate. So columns three and four are the results in the Spanish and, and math section of the exam. As you can see, pre-treatment across the four most columns, I don't see, I don't see a, 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 a consistent pattern of the aversion strengths. Okay? There is only, from all the four times four, 16 coefficients, only two are statistically significant and are marginally significant. And when I do the probability that the columns one to four, the coefficients are jointly uh, insignificant to zero, I fail to reject the null. So again, this is, I think this is very strong evidence in favor of the parallel trend assumption. So then I, I think I, 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 can, I can claim causality in my results. So, how long in time? Oh yeah, five minutes, I think I'm okay. So this is my main results. I'm using here a binary treatment. Treatment is I receive one test teacher 
in my school, a, a test teacher in my school compared to a discretionary teacher. I, in the column one, again, I have the same outcome, final enrollment. I don't see an, uh, an effect on the enrollment. The second, I think it's a very interesting outcome. So as you see, kids in a school that receive test teachers are less likely by three percentage points of cheating on the final, end of, on the final exam. This is half of the, of, of, the, of, of the mean of the variable. So you, you're, decreasing, you're decreasing cheating by half. It's a lot. Then I don't observe an effect on uh, student achievement. Now this is observed the student achievement, right? Because in a way you could expect that one of the main intentions of cheating is increasing scores. Otherwise, what would you cheat? Now, as a robustness check, I do the Abadis proposed uh, different different propensity score matching, basically to control for potential interactions between treat me, between treatment and, and locality characteristics that I'm not including in the model. Why? Because even if the both set of schools have similar trends, it's true that they are different in observable characteristics. And you could imagine that maybe test teachers are more efficient in larger communities. That means there is an interaction between treatment and community size. Because the size of the two communities, of the two set of the schools, are not the same, that would introduce bias in a, in a, in a typical definitive, right? So to, to, to see that, that, that there is no potential interaction between treatment and, 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 look, and time fixed characteristics, I, I, I do this, that is what is recommended in the literature. And what I get is an even higher effect, basically, on, on, on cheating. There's still nothing in the other. Now, again, as I was saying, you, I, I don't observe nothing in observed achievement. But again, we have to remember that one of the main objectives of cheating is increased test scores. And actually, what I have here, and it's just a correlation, is that the share of uh, flagged exams in a school increases dramatically the test scores, right? This is just telling what, this is just, this is just I think, basic uh, common sense. When in the schools where there is a lot of cheating, observe that the scores are higher. But that doesn't mean student achievement is higher. Cheating doesn't happen equally in, in, in different scenarios. And basically, what I study in the paper, and I cannot show you because there are some schools, to know, to predict current cheating, you have to go back. And basically, past cheating predicts current cheating. There is a school environment where cheating is easy. There's a school environment where cheating is hard. Why? Because maybe the parents don't like cheating. Maybe the, the, the other teachers don't like cheating. Maybe you have a good principal. There are structural reasons that make cheating difficult. OK, if I use schools where no pre-treatment cheating, and I focus on these schools, this is the results that I get with my binary interpretation. This is the set of schools with no structural cheating, let's say. Okay. So I, now I don't find an effect on, on, on cheating because here cheating is difficult. The point estimate on, uh, on a student achievement and math and student scores is around point 0.13 standard deviation, but it's not statistically significant. Now again, as I said before, this is really an intention to treat parameter because you have typically one teacher getting into a school with four classrooms. Okay? So what if I adapt and I put intensity of treatment? and I use as my treatment variable the share of teachers in the school that are test hired. And then, if I do that, I get a very high and statistically significant effect on observed teaching scores, which is column three and four. So what I, what I observe in this paper is education officials hire on average teacher of less quality. When they follow a discretionary process with a strong participation from the teachers' union, that when they use this second best rule. Now, joint committees of union representatives and officials allocate these worst teachers to localities in more desirable localities, to schools in more lo desirable localities. So I, I would argue that these results suggest the existence of an agency problem with rent extraction. They're basically hiring worst teachers and rewarding them with better conditions. Now, using a hard-to-manipulate rule, 
for hiring can reduce the extent of the agency problems in this context. So I think the findings are particularly with weak institutions. In a recent paper by Duflo, Dupas, and Kramer, they find that using an RCT, or the structure of an ICT, they find that schools with better, let's say, school governance, in schools with better school governance, reduce the likelihood that parents hire a teacher relative, which I think is kind of the same intuition I think. And I think also, in addition, bring new evidence about the benefits of teacher quality beyond gains in scholastic achievement. If you think that maybe not cheering is also part of a different set of skills, that may be non-cognitive skills, and may be part also of building citizenship. And maybe good teachers can also help on that. This is a very, a very nice paper on a very relevant topic, uh, which goes uh, uh, at the core of a question which is critical uh, in development, which is uh, how to identify quality teachers. So what he does essentially, uh, to summarize, uh, uh, the paper is compare two procedures in teacher hiring. The first uh, procedure involves uh, committees with participation of teacher union representatives. The second one uses as an instrument a standardized test. Uh, the conceptual motivation is that there may be an agency problem. On the one hand, uh, one may argue that teachers uh, may be better able to evaluate teacher quality, but on the other hand, uh, they have uh, greater discretion. There are no specific criteria that they should follow when they evaluate uh, uh, teachers, and so there may be a point to having a more objective ev evaluation. Uh, so the, the paper essentially compares these two methods of, of hiring. Uh, it uses different, different techniques since uh, uh, schools self-select themselves into the, into the study sample. Some of the states didn't uh, accept to receive uh, test teachers, uh, if, if I understood the paper well. Uh, so there's some uh, uh, potential uh, selection uh, problem there. Uh, he uses different robustness tests, different specifications, and results are pretty consistent across the specifications. Uh, uh, the, the central problem, I think, is that the data is not the best uh, to test the hypothesis. So all, uh, in approaching the, the effect uh, uh, of uh, uh, hiring uh, teachers through tests has to be done through indirect means. And, and I think Ricardo does uh, as best as, uh, as possible in, in uh, getting around uh, this problem. To, to summarize the results, uh, he finds no effects of newly hired test teachers versus newly hired discretionary teachers on uh, three variables, enrollment, student test, uh, uh, excuse me, in two variables, enrollment, the student test scores in mathematics and student test scores in, in Spanish. Uh, and this is for the full sample. Uh, he finds effects on, teach, on cheating. Test teachers are associated with lower cheating rates. And uh, uh, finally, he, for a restricted sample, a sample of, of, of schools where cheating hasn't uh, been detected, he finds significant positive effects on, on test scores. So, um, some, some um, uh, comments on a more critical line. Uh, first, uh, although he mentions it in the paper and also in the presentation, I think he may be, uh, uh, argue more strongly that these are lower bound estimates. And I find uh, at least three reasons. Uh, I would add another one I, I, that occurred to me while uh, uh, he was presenting, uh, and which is that these are uh, telesecondary schools, uh, escuelas telesecundarias, which have a very important technological component. So how important are teachers in that context uh, is an open question. Are they more important than in regular schools, or are they less important? Uh, 
intuitively I would think they may be less important because most of the material or a lot of the material comes from means that are not the teacher himself or herself. So that's one reason why uh, it, it'd be difficult uh, to, to uh, find the estimates and, and the estimates found maybe lower bound. The second is that test results are on the very same year that teachers were hired. So these are teachers that have been in the school for less than one year. Uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it's really um, to stretch the point that a teacher can ma make a significant difference in just one year. Although, you know, these are small schools, so uh, my impression is, uh, still is that uh, uh, it'd be difficult for teachers to make a large difference in, in one year. Second, uh, tests are on ninth grade students. So uh, students have been already educated by uh, discretionary teachers through at least eight years. Um, so, uh, would one uh, test teacher for one year make a difference? I, 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 I'm a skeptical about it. And, and fourth, um, allocation of test teachers to ninth grade, uh, we don't know really how many of these teachers are teaching ninth grade. It may be that none of them is. Uh, so, uh, and at any rate, the probability, since we have four grades, is just uh, 0.25 to be teaching. In. So all these factors uh, uh, result in, in, the, uh, in the fact that if you can estimate uh, the effect of, of uh, test teachers, uh, it, these, are, these may very well be a lower bound estimates. And so it's no surprise that there are difficulties in, in identifying effects. The, the uh, uh, description of, of the procedures for, uh, used by uh, the, the discretionary pattern of, of hiring are, are quite telling. Uh, and uh, So one would really expect that a more objective evaluation of teachers would make a difference. Uh, however, as I said, I, I, I don't think the data, this, this data uh, is the best uh, for, for that purpose. Um, the, the last point uh, was already clarified. Uh, so you excluded from the sample uh, schools that may have potentially received both types of teachers. My second large, uh, my second important comment is on cheating as an outcome variable. Uh, the argument is that cheating uh, is an indicator of teacher quality, and so if you find lower cheating, in, it, uh, this is arguably uh, associated uh, to the fact that they uh, have a better teacher. Is this so? Uh, can teachers really affect the pattern of, uh, of cheating? I think this, this needs to be elaborated. I, I, I don't see any uh, a strong intuition that can guide uh, uh, these results. So I, I would suggest that more discussion of, of, of this um, would be uh, valuable. Um, there are, uh, f uh, uh, further, there are no observable determinants of cheating schools. So history is the only predictor that, that you have. Uh, I think, you know, all, uh, these two facts uh, call for uh, a greater focus on, on, you know, why cheating is a good, since you cannot find uh, uh, impacts on outcomes of the students uh, and cheating becomes your uh, uh, result variable, I think you have to uh, better argue why cheating is, is a good outcome variable, no? And, uh, uh, literature, conceptual discussion can, can, can be useful in, in this direction. Uh, I'm also a, a bit skeptical about the way uh, cheating is detected. Uh, just one example, suppose the, the, the students uh, have a very lousy teacher. Uh, they will tend to make the same mistake 
if the teacher has taught them wrong. Uh, so this may show up in the in the standardized tests, and and so I'm I'm you know I'm not familiar at all with this literature on how um, this uh, cheating is is measured um, uh, through this uh, technology of identifying correlation in errors uh, uh, within groups, uh, but. Uh, I think this needs to also to, to be uh, further uh, elaborated. Also, uh, even though teachers do not supervise their own schools, it is their colleagues that supervise their, uh, their students. So if indeed teachers are conscious, are conscious that the test results are important, then uh, uh, and if the teacher was willing to, to cheat in favor of his students, why wouldn't he convince his fellow teacher to also help him in that task. Uh, so, you know, there, there are, uh, uh, these, these are points that maybe you should elaborate a bit more on. The external validity is also, these are particular samples of schools, and, and, and I've already uh, pointed out some, some implications, you know, use of technology, uh, for instance. Control schools have more classrooms, so, uh, one to two teachers uh, effects may be more limited in control schools as they, they have on average one, one, uh, one more classroom. So again, the teacher effect may dilute uh, farther, you know, the greater, uh, the larger the size of the school and, and the measure of size of schools in this case is number of classrooms. Uh, second, treated schools are in poorer areas. So one question is, are there any other interventions in these poor areas that may be targeting these very students and maybe affecting the results? Uh, I, would, I would check on that uh, and, and maybe include a, a paragraph on two. Maybe there are no interventions relevant, but I think that uh, uh, this needs to be discussed in, in the text. One uh, strange uh, pattern in the data is in the case that the poorer schools are not the ones with the larger share of indigenous population. Uh, for someone uh, uh, that you know, knows more about uh, Peru, uh, this, is, uh, this is surprising. And it seems not only Peru, if, if, if uh, Felipe was thinking of Colombia as well. Uh, indigenous uh, students in Peru tend to be in the poorer areas. In this case, we find that indigenous students are not in the poorer areas. Uh, so, uh, which brings an to, to another question. Uh, we may have different mix of indigenous population in different schools, and as uh, uh, Felipe pointed out, indigenous, population, indigenous students tend to have lower test scores. So, this, there may be uh, uh, something here in, in the sorting of indigenous students uh, across the schools. Finally, uh, restricting the samples to non-cheater non -cheater schools where uh, Ricardo obtains a, a significant impacts uh, on, on test scores uh, may, be, uh, may have other selection implications that are not uh, uh, as thoroughly discussed in the text as the discussion for the whole sample. Oh